Well hello scrappers, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do sort of a quick Q&A video. Um, I get a lot of questions from viewers and uh, a lot of them are the same questions over and over and over again. And you know, I'll respond to questions in the comments of my videos with a comment of my own, but a lot of people apparently don't read that or they're coming to my channel for the first time or whatever and I just get the same questions again in the next video and in the next video and the next video. So I thought I'd make a video. Probably it will end up being a series of videos over time as people ask new questions. They get asked over and over again. Um, so I, I'll make a video here to answer some of the most common questions I get right now and maybe down the road in the future we'll do it again as I get new questions, or maybe we'll just reiterate the same old questions if they keep coming up again. So, I have a list of uh, questions I get a lot in here, no particular order. Um, okay, so in my series of videos on my copper refining cell, why didn't I use copper sulfate as the electrolyte? Why did I use copper nitrate? Well, because I had a boatload of copper nitrate, and I didn't think I had any copper sulfate. Um, after rummaging around in my chemical stores, I found that I did have some copper sulfate, but by then I already had the cell up and running. And it was actually working pretty darn well with the copper nitrate. And in the literature that I read, you know, leading up to running the cell, because I read up on it a little bit, you know, copper nitrate is not unheard of for use as an electrolyte in a copper refining cell. So, I thought it was going to work just fine, and it did work pretty darn well. There were some side effects. Um, I can see how copper nitrate is not the ideal material for, or it's not the ideal electrolyte for working itself. So, in the future, I'm working on some big changes to the electrolytic cell. It's going to look a lot different the next time I run it, and hopefully it'll work a little bit better, um, a little bit more predictable in the way it operates. Um, and uh, I will switch to using copper sulfate since apparently I have some and I was not aware I had some. I will switch to using copper sulfate and sulfuric acid electrolyte in the cell and we'll see how that goes. I'm also going to make some other changes. There's going to be changes in the way. This is going to answer some other questions people have probably. There's going to be changes in the way that the, uh, the electrodes, the anodes and cathodes are attached to the voltage rails. Just They're going to get much more securely attached. Um, there's going to be, I'm also going to cast some, um, some plates for the anodes rather than just having my ingots hanging down in there. Um, so I think that's going to work better if the casting molds I'm making out of graphite work well. We'll see. So, yeah, so there's going to be some big changes and that's a ways down the road yet because I've got a lot of work to do and I've got a lot of other projects in the works right now. But there will be another run of the, uh, the copper refining cell with copper sulfate as an electrolyte and a lot of other changes to the way the cell works and um, I hope you'll find that series as interesting as you found the last series and I hope it'll work at least as well as uh, it did the last time. I'll probably run more copper through it than last time so that I actually get a reasonable amount of gold out of it and make it worth worthwhile. So. Anyway, it'll be an interesting experiment to see if I can actually improve the cell. So, uh, yeah, so that was one of the biggest questions I got about copper nitrate versus copper sulfate. Why? So that's kind of why, because I had it on hand. Um, okay, another question I get in almost every gold refining video I do is, why didn't you put any sulfuric acid in there to drop the lead? And I don't know how many times I've answered this question. I've actually made videos about why I don't generally put sulfuric acid in to drop the lead. Because I use sulfamic acid to denox the liquids. Okay? What happens when sulfamic acid interacts with nitric acid? It destroys the nitric acid. And the resulting compounds from that destruction are nitrous oxide gas which comes bubbling out of solution sometimes violently if you've got a big excess of nitric acid and the other compound that's produced is sulfuric acid so by denoxing with uh, sulfamic acid I get my sulfuric acid for free I don't have to put any sulfuric acid in there it just appears now 
the only case where that doesn't work well, and I have seen issues with it, is if you don't have an excess of nitric acid at the end. If you've been really stingy with your nitric acid additions and you put in pretty much just the amount you need to get, you know, your gold and precious metals in solution, um, and you go to denox it with the sulfamic acid and you pour sulfamic acid in and pretty much nothing happens, you don't get that uh, big bubbling of nitrous oxide out of solution, then you're not going to get any sulfuric acid in there either. So I, I don't generally worry about, you know, having a little bit of excess nitric acid. A lot of people are really careful to not over nitric their solutions. They don't want to have to denox it. Um, I don't worry about that. I want to generally have a little bit of excess nitric acid in there, so when I denox it with uh, sulfamic acid, I'll see that reaction, and I'll know that I'm getting some sulfuric acid in there for free, and it's going to help drop the lead compounds out of there. Um, also, I'll know, you know, I, I work with a lot of opaque solutions, like uh, this stuff over here, the remains of IC chips, is dark black. There's a lot of gold in this beaker, but you can't see it very well. Um, it's hard to tell whether it's all gone into solution or not. But if I have an excess of nitric acid in here, after, you know, I, I dissolve the gold in aqua regia, I'll know that all the gold is probably in solution. If there's no excess of nitric acid, I can't be sure whether it's all in solution or not. Maybe all of the nitric acid just got used up and there's still gold in there. So I always aim for a little bit of an excess of nitric acid in my solutions. I put the sulfamic acid in, I see the fizzing, uh, the, the nitrous oxide production, and I know, okay, good. We're getting our sulfuric acid in there, we're going to drop the lead, all of the gold's in solution, everything's hunky-dory. Okay, so that's, that's why I do that. So I use sulfamic acid to denox my solutions, so I don't have to put the sulfuric in it because sulfuric acid is one of the byproducts of sulfamic acid breaking down and destroying nitrous, nitric acid. So that's why. And I don't know how many times I've answered that question, and I still get it all the time. Okay. The Improvised Impact Mill series of videos. Um, probably the most uh, asked question I get on that is, why aren't you running that wet? And well, I probably will run it wet in the future. Um, it's actually not a bad idea. I don't particularly like dealing with the dust, although I have the equipment to move dust, you know? In the last video, I put together, it's actually over here on a camera, I put together a dust collection system with my, with my shop vac and a cyclone separator and a collection can and, and it works really great for getting, you know, the finely pulverized dust out of the uh, out of the grinder. So, you know, that works pretty good. Now, running it wet. Yeah, I can see how there would be some advantages to that. I'm not quite set up for it. I'm working on it, though. And I think down the road, you will see me at least experiment with running the, the uh, impact mill wet. And we'll see how that goes. I, I'm going to work to get... Um, I'm working on building a stack of sieves that I can put over a five gallon bucket and the top sieve will be very coarse and it'll just catch the balls and everything else will go through and the next few sieves will be finer finer and they'll catch more of the oversized debris and the final sieve will just let the bond wires and the finest material through and I'll just wash everything out of the uh, out of the the tub of the thing through all these sieves and wind up with the stuff I want to keep in the five gallon bucket on the bottom and you know the balls I want to keep in the sieve on the top and everything in between should be garbage so we'll see how that works stuff's on order it hasn't arrived yet when it gets here um, I'll run a test but of course I'm always a few videos ahead so it's going to be down the road a little bit before I see any kind of wet testing experiments with the uh, with the impact mill. But it's coming. It's coming, trust me. Those of you who uh, who really want me to run it wet, we'll give it a try. I, I don't know how I don't know how having the, the water in there is going to cushion the bouncing around of the balls. That was the thing I was worried about when I first put the thing together. I thought, well, they're just going to bounce around in air and smash into each other hard. That should be a do a pretty good job of grinding this stuff up, and it does. 
we'll see how good a job it does of grinding it up when the thing is full of water as well and the water's there to cushion the motion of, of the ball bearings. It, it may, we may not get as fine a grind. I don't know. We'll find out. Interesting experiment. And, uh, you know, everybody who suggested it, thank you. And uh, you will get a look at that in the future. Okay, another really, really, really popular question I get is, why the heck aren't you using a stir plate? Or, or a heat stir plate? And, well, the simple answer to that is, I don't have one. I don't have any stir bars either. Okay, um, these little uh, hot plates I use are dirt cheap. They're like 19, 20 bucks a piece, and they don't last too long when exposed to the chemicals that are being liberated in the fume hood here. I'm, I'm reluctant to invest a lot of money in a piece of equipment that's just going to get rotted away by uh, the, the, the hydrochloric acid fumes and the nitrous dioxide fumes that are released in the fume hood here. Um, you know, the stir plates are not cheap, but I'm going to get one just to see how much better it works and how long it's going to last in here before it falls apart like these cheap hot plates do that I'm constantly having to replace. I got a bad feeling that I'm going to spend a fair amount of money on a stir plate and I might get six months life out of it before the thing falls apart. We'll see. Uh, the chemicals in here are really, really hard on the equipment. Really, really hard. The hot plates fall apart in no time. You know, I have to replace the blower in this thing every six months or so, too. Um, the hinges are rotting away, even though I 3D printed those hinges. It's not so much the hinges, it's the bolts that are holding them on. And they're stainless steel. They're still rotting away. So, yeah. The, uh, the chemicals, they destroy the stuff. So I try to keep my equipment cheap so it doesn't hurt too bad when it, uh, when it craps out. It's going to hurt when that extensive surf plate stops working. And I'll be dependent on it by then. I figured out ways to work without it. But I'm going to get one. Again, it's down the road because I'm always a few videos ahead. I've got quite a few videos already in the tank, mostly in the tank, and we got to work our way through those. And then once the stir plate arrives, we'll start making new videos using it, and we'll see how it goes. We'll see how long it lasts. Okay. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to keep my costs down, man. And it's a rough environment in there. It just chews stuff up. So keep that in mind if you want to do this at home. The chemicals liberated by this, the, the chemical fumes liberated by what I do in here will destroy your equipment. Pretty much only the ceramics and the glass aren't bothered by it. Everything else just falls apart. Okay, and now I guess it's time to address the elephant in the room. Three tips. What I get more often than not in the comments and the emails that come to me is questions like why aren't you doing this like three tips does why didn't you do that like three tips does have you watched three tips you should watch three tips and see how he does things well yeah i have watched three tips and i know how he does things and, and his, his channel's great his videos are excellent i think they're both very entertaining and very educational and well done and um, very knowledgeable. I've learned a lot from him, I have to admit. Um, but, you know, Street Tips and I were kind of on different levels. You know, I'm just a, kind of a hobbyist e-waste refiner, you know, small scale. And um, he's doing big lots of uh, jewelry gold and stuff, you know. I, you know, I'd call him a semi-professional or even a professional at what he does, and I'm just a hobbyist. So, we do things differently, you know. Um, he's got much better equipment than I do. He's got a lot more experience than I do. He certainly works with larger lots of precious metals than I do. Um, so, you know, necessarily we're going to be doing things differently. Um, also, he has a different feedstock than I do. He's working mostly with jewelry scraps, or even outright jewelry. And I'm working with e-waste, you know. Going from, you know, a pile of old rings and earrings and, and necklaces to a bar of gold, the steps are a whole lot different than going from a pile of IC chips to a bar of gold. So our methods 
are going to be very different. And not only, you know, are our methods necessarily different because of our different feedstocks, I try, you know, hard not to just copy other people. You know, I suppose I could write Omega Geek 64 on all of my glassware and three or four times on my fume hood and on my scale and all that, but, you know, no, that's just one example. Um, I'm sure he does that for, you know, copyright reasons. I'm sure a lot of people, his videos are very popular, I'm sure a lot of people would like to pirate them, so, you know, there's no doubt it's a Street Tips video that you're, you're watching with him. Uh, I'm not popular enough to be pirated. But, uh, you know, aside from that, I just try not to copy, outright copy, other people too closely. I try to give you a sort of unique experience here that you're not going to get on some other channel. Yeah, so I, I try not to just outright copy people or too closely emulate them, you know. I, I do things my way. Show you how you could do things inexpensively without a lot of fancy equipment, a lot of fa big fancy lab, big fancy fume hood. I mean, heck, I built this thing for a few bucks and it's lasted me forever now. Um, you know, smaller scale, hobby scale, you know, how to do it. And uh, yeah, I mean, Sweet Tips is great. And uh, I watch his videos. I think you folks out in my audience should watch his videos too. Uh, just don't forget about me. Come back and watch mine again, too. But, yeah, I'm trying to give you a unique experience here. I'm not trying to give you the Street Tips experience. I'm not trying to give you the Owl Tech experience, you know, or or the Mount Baker Mining and Metals experience, or any of the other popular channels out there. I'm trying to give you my experience. And, you know, I hope you find something interesting, you know, in my experience. Something useful, interesting, helpful, educational killed some time anyway, whatever, in uh, in the way I do things. So, uh, yeah, so that's why, and, and yeah, to answer the questions, yes, okay, I have seen how Street Tips does it. I know how Street Tips does it. Uh, I have to do it differently. I got a different feedstock, different steps in the process, you know? So, and I don't really want to just copy Street Tips. I want to do, do my own thing. Be my own man, you know? All right. So, I think that'll be it for the first viewer Q&A uh, special here. I'm sure there will be more in the future. I hope I won't have to answer all of these same questions over again. But uh, I imagine this won't be the end of it. I imagine they'll keep getting asked. But in the future, I'm sure there'll be a few more viewer Q&As as uh, I start getting more questions asked over and over and over again um, every time a new video comes out. And, uh, hey, I don't mind. Uh, in fact, I encourage you, not only do I not mind it, I encourage you to ask questions of me, okay? And, you know, if I see questions that pop up a lot, I will do another Q&A and I will include those questions in it. So feel free, you know, in the comments of this video or in my other videos, ask questions. Ask lots of questions. Uh, email me. You can find my email on my blog, mdpub.com. Email me, whatever. And, um, yeah, I will answer your questions. And if they're popular questions that lots of people want to know the answer to, I'll make a video and uh, answer them for everybody. Okay. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you found this video at least a little bit interesting. Give it a thumbs up. Give it a like. Uh, subscribe to see my future videos. Check out my second channel, ElectroGeek64. Uh, there's some interesting stuff there, too. Uh, subscribe and like on it as well. And press the little bell icon that YouTube makes you press to be notified when new videos come out. And thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video.